Crypto markets crash after the Bank of Japan hikes rates and triggers a global risk asset liquidation. With long-standing ranges now broken to the downside, Bitcoin looks vulnerable for further weakness, creating demand for put hedges. And ETH vol outperforms as ETF inflows don't turn up. All this and more in this week's Crypto Options Unplugged. Welcome back to Crypto Options Unplugged, everyone. I'm Imran Larka from Options Insight. I've got my man Dave from FRNT. And oh my God, Dave, what <laughs> a week. Huh? These are weeks you live for, no? As a vol guy. Yeah, when you own some options. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, every, not... Everyone's just sell vol, sell vol, yeah. sell vol. And, um, Unfortunately, yeah, didn't doesn't. really get ahead of that move, personally. Yeah. Uh, had a, had a few hedges on, yeah. not as much as I would have liked because I, I got puffed into the whole bull story looking for a break of the range to the upside, but clearly we got a break to the downside. But look, you're the macro man. Yeah, Tell us what the hell's going on. Is it the end of the world like a lot of people are calling for <laughs> or do we need calmer heads? Um, definitely you need calmer heads, um, but it's, yeah, it's probably worth trying to understand exactly what has gone on. Um, I always question from a macro side, you know, was I ahead of it enough? Um, and and probably the answer is always no. These things, um, when you get a risk blow up, they they tend to happen quite quickly, as we mm -hmm. saw. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess long story short, everyone's talking about the yen carry trade and carry on wines. So it's probably it's worth, everyone's favourite phrase. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's yeah. become an expert in it. Um, but it's probably worth sort of talking about it and trying to kind of simplify that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the simple story is. So you've had zero rates in Japan since forever, right? Mm -hmm. um, largely sort of disinflationary economy. Um, they had their big asset bubble collapse back in the 90s. Um, and funny, someone who talks about the Japanification of the Western world, large debt, poor demographics, which is typically very disinflationary. So they've been at zero rates since forever yeah. um, for a long time. And they stayed at zero, even though all other central banks were hiking because yeah. of inflation. They were just staying there, staying there, staying there, right? Exactly. And yeah, it's taken really like longer for inflation to sort of filter through in, into Japan. So the rest of the world's hiked rates, Fed are at five and a half, and Japan are still at zero. So the carry trade was to basically borrow um, borrow at zero in, mm -hmm. in Japan, in Japanese yen, mm -hmm. and then use that to then go invest in riskier, high-yielding assets be that other currencies, including the dollar, um, be that in Nikkei, be that in NASDAQ, but you can basically borrow for zero and then go and go and buy. Um, Which is effectively what um, Warren Buffett did. Yeah, yeah. Right, when he went long Japan. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that was a trade. Um, obviously built a lot of momentum. Then you, you get all these kind of legs of that trade where so dollar yen goes up, Nikkei goes up, and it becomes like a reinforcing momentum trade, one big, carry momentum trade mm -hmm. so that's been the trade that's been running you've seen like dollar yen go from you know 100 to to you know the levels that it kind of reached sort of 160 or have you um and through that whole process of keeping rates low and just buying bonds buying bonds buying bonds the bank of japan have effectively like cornered their entire bond market right oh, they, yeah, they yeah. hold pretty much all the jgbs out there yeah for, yeah right? and and what like japan's got what 260 percent debt GDP like it's just I mean we're all going the same route the US will be there and the currency just gets devalued and goes lower and lower and lower so yeah. then so now dollar yen hits a point at like what was it 160 odd yeah I where the ministry of yeah. finance like enough is enough right so yeah. what is the motivation there why why won't they let the, the yen just com continue going to zero because because everything's a confidence game right like you, you like you, you need to be seen to be the you know you, like if if because then you flip into the other world where you become like emerging market, yeah, you know, Venezuela or somewhere like that, where right, um, you, a lot of hyperinflation. Yeah. So, in. so you need to at least maintain this. I always call it the veil of stability. That like no, pretend no, that you, you're, yeah, that you're we, keeping a lid on we it. We are in control. Yeah, it's the same okay. same what they all do with the debt and everything. Like well, mm. the US now has got thirty five trillion dollars worth of debt. Like they're never paying it back. But as long as everyone thinks they will at some point. Which then, they won't. Which they won't. Way. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is why we buy Bitcoin, right? Yeah. But, yeah. But as, but you know, if if they come out, for example, and said we are never paying back that debt, 
like the dollar and everything collapses, right? So they just they just keep this okay. game going. Sure. So Japan have to keep it going, and and it does obviously cause problems, right? If your currency is just collapsing. Um, well, you were saying about China, right? The more the yen was collapsing, it was a problem for China. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it loses like investors will will bow out of your country and everything. So. Okay. Um, it, it becomes problematic. So they, they were trying to obviously slow that move and actually intervene and reverse that move. Mm -hmm. But then they have actually got inflation, um, which has started to return. So they've been, they've been, they moved rates, they had negative interest rate policy, went to zero. So I, I guess the key event, so last week, was it Monday, Tuesday, um, they hiked rates to 25 bips. Um, it was kind of telegraphed um, a day or two before. Yeah. Um, hiked rates they're still by the way doing bond buying quantitative easing but they're, mm -hmm. they're kind of tapering it's just the signaling yeah. of it right yeah so you've actually seen um because on the day not a lot happened right? no no yeah. and in fact like dollar yen actually bounced because the actual tapering of the bond purchases was less than people thought. yeah that's right um so it was actually seen as slightly sort of dovish i guess mm -hmm. um what they did and at that point the the rate hike was expected You'd already seen, obviously, I was away on holiday, but like NASDAQ and Nikkei and stuff were already under pressure as the dollar yen was falling. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying about these legs, you had like, like it was like long dollar yen, long Nikkei, long NASDAQ, long emerging market currencies. All these become almost like one trade, right? Mm -hmm. that, that They're all highly correlated and, and sort of leveraged. So we'd already, I think, started to see a, a bit of an unwind of that trade. Um, and then as as one leg of a trade like that starts to fail, i.e. dollar yen, then obviously you then have to start reducing your other legs. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Friday, we got the US employment report. Now, the, the U, US rates like, were, were rallying already, our yields coming lower, um, and this recession fear story started to, to catch hold. We had a really weak ISM mm -hmm. um, manufacturing print, um, the, the jolts um, survey, it was kind of like pointing to weakness in the jobs market. Friday comes along, really weak non-farm payrolls number. We have a spike in unemployment to 4.3%. Mm -hmm. Everyone's on their right. The US in recession or is going to recession. US yields get crushed. US yields get crushed. The 10 year gap through 4% and went yeah. straight to 380, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, everyone's saying the Fed needs to cut 50 basis points. Market starts pricing that. JP Morgan, Citibank all coming in saying we're now calling for back to back 50 bit cuts. Mm hmm. Huge change, right? So and that something, in itself accelerated yeah. the dollar yen move, right? Yeah. Because that's dollar weakness, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and something, by the way, that I've been talking about for a while, okay, on, on this on this podcast, the, the, the weakness in the labor market has been quite apparent for a few months. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I kind of felt the market was underpriced for the rate cuts that will come. Mm. We got all of a sudden in the space but of it, a few it hours. Feels like, it feels like the market has to get spooked to force the rate cuts, right? Because it, it's almost like, if the market's chilled out and like, let's say the, the labor market data rolls over, yeah. but the market goes nowhere and doesn't react to it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't force the issue for the Fed to make them act. So it's like they're not going to necessarily preemptively be as aggressive in cutting unless the market pukes yeah. a quick 10% and then they'll be like, okay, there's your 50 bit cut. Yeah, that right? or if, if the data just, just collapses. Now, I, I wouldn't say as well, I'm not jumping on the, like, it, it wasn't, I mean, 4.3% unemployment. It's not like 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 world ending type stuff. Not like COVID. But, but I, I think, and the point that I always make, employment is the most lagging of indicators in any economy. It's the last thing to go, right? People let people go at the last moment mm -hmm. and it's it's the most kind of what we call up the stairs down the elevator shaft like data series right when it when it goes it goes right and like recessions recessions come quickly when they come and i think that just sparked the oh shit moment of right the fed have overcooked it um so we start pricing that now obviously because of that you've had on the monday japan have just hiked rates you've now got the market in the u.s aggressively repriced the fed to talking about 50 basis points of cuts in september mm. dollar yen that important dollar yen leg tanks mm -hmm. right and then that triggers everything else again mm -hmm. right so i mean so nikkei, this, nikkei had the worst drop since what 87 or something yeah it? so th this momentum based carry trade that was highly levered mm. i i think the it was the dollar yen leg falling that starts to trigger all the other legs right mm. so then that that collapsed and it was just one big right dollar yen's gone so now nikkei's gone now Nasdaq's so the big gone. question on everyone's minds yeah. though is it done yet so so my so this is my thoughts on it so so firstly i i 
the, the talk about like the carry trade on one. Yeah, yes, it's a carry trade on wine, but I think it's less to do about the rate side of things as much as it is to do about this dollar yen uh, leg and then how that was kind of leveraged and part of this momentum trade um, that was all highly correlated. So we, we, we had obviously that, that big sort of washout. And then what happens? Well, vol spikes. I mean, what did the VIX get to? Like, like some sort of crazy well, it's level. Funny, like it printed in the sixties, but apparently that was a misprint, right? From the CBO yeah. or something, right? So the real number was in the forties, but that's yeah. still crazy high, right? I mean, we're used to seeing 20, 20 being a high for yeah. the VIX, but it, it doubled that, right? Yeah, more than doubled. So, so this is what's going on. So, you've got this momentum trade that's now been all the stops are being triggered, right? Vol spikes. The vol spike that means, like, even if you weren't on that trade. You, you, get, to de-risk. you get this VAR shock, right? This value at risk shock, right? Yeah. So all risk managers everywhere get, get the tap on the shoulder and yeah. say, you have to gross down risk. Mm-hmm. And it's not about, oh, I don't like this trade, that trade. It's, it's gross everything. doesn't matter. Everything yeah. comes down. If you're along that, you, you, you take it off. If you were short that, you buy it back. Mm-hmm. You gross down risk, right? You take, you net, you take off risk. Yeah. So obviously, basically, I always say all correlations go to one in those moments because everyone just sells everything. Um, yeah, yeah. And there's loads of pockets of stress, positions. right? There's a dispersion trade. There's the momentum trade. There's all these little trades that became crowded yep. that need to be flushed out. But how do we know if it's done? How how do we how can we tell if we're in the later innings of that flush out or if it's got another month to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you can sort of tell just by in, in some ways by the price action. Um, or, or, or I guess like the smaller money's out and done, stopped out, like um, that mm-hmm. that'll all be finished. The, the other big one as well, which I'm surprised I haven't heard more talk about all the, the sort of macro tourists like to talk about the risk parity funds, but I'm sure a couple of those blew up. Now, the risk parity guys, they essentially allocate, um, they allocate according to like vol buckets and never cause that. So if you think of, if you think of, um, you know, like a 60, 40 portfolio, 60 percent equities, 40 percent bonds, they, they allocate according to like, like volatility. So when you've had like a low vol regime like we've had in equities they ramp up the leverage because on the vol adjusted basis they, they're able to do that so obviously when you get that vol spike again they're all having to de-risk mm. so you, you've seen this big de-risk in trade mm. um but the macro correct me if i'm wrong the macro picture is becoming more positive yeah yeah and for right? bitcoin like and like, these sort of yeah. events actually force it in yeah. that positive direction because they force the Correct. liquidity to come sooner, basically, Correct. right? Yeah. So yeah. the first, so the first stage of this, you you, you get the de risk and you just sell everything, right? So mm-hmm. that that's what we're going through. How long does it have to run? I'm not sure. Um, it tends to come now, and and the bigger money that's still got more to unwind comes in waves. I, I say it's yeah. like very mechanical selling. Like yeah. they'll, they'll they'll wake up today and also right, you need to de risk a bit more. They'll do it, and and that's why I tend to like into like the U.S. close and things like that. You see equities get sold. You do like the last yeah. few days. You've definitely seen yeah, much it comes in waves. It's in the last hour or two, yeah. And, and it's hard to tell. I saw J.P. Morgan out today saying that um, they think seventy five percent of it's run. So mm-hmm. there's an overhang. Well, I think there's a conflict between J.P. and Goldman's. Goldman's are a bit more bearish, right? And uh, I think they were saying that the momentum trade has got ahead of itself. If you compare it to previous years. The momentum factor bas the the bas you know how they're yeah, baskets yeah. of those of those style factors. Yeah. Momentum factors up like still thirty percent plus on the year. Yeah. It's got a load of unwinding to still to so if, if the AI trade is still got unwinding to do, then then that could keep things weak. But we've got Nvidia earnings coming up later yeah. in the month, so that might be. I think the pivot point might be Nvidia earnings where yeah. we can start to rally again if if we're too bearish going yeah. into that. Basically. But 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 this this is right? my point. This is where I don't think this is a big carry unwind in terms of. The, the there was a leverage momentum trade that was going on, and that's what's blown up. Mm. And and all all the big kind of macro bears out there, they, they're talking about they, there's something like four trillion dollars worth of um, j- Japanese money invested abroad, right? Most most of that is actually in bonds, about over fifty percent. So the the fear is if if that then all gets sold, that funding trade sort of starts to unwind and they sell those assets us equities bonds everything and repatriate it back home mm. then then we've got a bigger shit show on our hands mm. but the fact is is that money like typically the pension funds like the life or insurance funds in japan that's where the big money is and they move a very slowly very infrequently and then also I like, unlikely 25, bips enough 25 them. exactly it's not yeah. what they will do now, now you've had U.S. rates fall as uh, Japanese rates have, have risen. 
the but have they risen? Like, isn't isn't the JGB actually trading on a lower yield? Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not materially so, and actually, yeah. a lot of the work's been done on the US side. Mm -hmm. But but now they the costs of hedging out your yen exposure have now reduced. So actually, probably what's more likely to happen rather than selling down like US assets, they're just going to probably up up their hedge ratios, which will keep dollar yen going down. So. The big offset to all of this, and the, and now this is like the the kind of positive, um, and why I actually think I I think this past week probably marks the start of, of Bitcoin's next leg higher. Once we finish this kind of the de-risk period, yeah, yeah, we're obviously now going into Fed are going to have a far more aggressive cutting cycle than was previously priced. All liquidity returns back to the market. China now the pressure's off their currency, their economy is still still struggling. They can now really ramp up stimulus because they haven't got to worry about their currency anymore. I think that's anymore. interesting. That point yeah. where China was kind of being a bit hamstrung by the weakness in the yen, and now that that's strengthened so much, it, if it gives them room to stimulate, yeah. then we know what can happen to just assets when they do that. Right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so, and then the big offset as well to everything is when you've got a weaker dollar, that that is kind of like from a liquidity point of view, that's quite stimulative, um, you know, in a, in a, in a world that's sort of driven by a dollar. So weaker dollar, um, it is a kind of liquidity positive. You've got lower rates. Mm -hmm. you, you've got, again, you know, a fiat system that's shown it can't handle these real rates before something breaks. The bank of Japan, by the way, did a, a kind of U-turn a little bit Backtrack. Yeah, and kind of went, look, we won't keep doing this if things keep blowing up. Yeah, and it kind of just reinforces that like the whole thing. That quickly, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think we now we we have the conditions for Bitcoin to completely make its next leg higher. It just needs to get through this de-risking yeah, process. Yeah, exactly. my only pushback on that would be that from a technical standpoint, and it does trade very technically. Yeah. We've done a lot of damage to the technicals, right? Because we were in that range, carving out that range, carving out that range, and then we broke into the downside. Yeah. So the question then is. Does this open the door for like a 40 to 45k handle before this is done, right? Because people be before were looking at 50s. I don't know. I've got I've seen some people talking about, you know, the stress in the miners. If we get if we go too low, then then miners are forced to sell and stuff like that. So I don't know. Um the truth is, I think we all know where it's headed longer term. Yeah. So you just have to be able to navigate these sort of moves. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I, you know, I, that's what options are for. Right. That's why that's why we do this podcast to talk about how options can help people navigate these sort of swings. Yeah. And now is a prime time to be using option hedges, I would have thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is this is um for, for the vol guys. This is this is like perfect, um, you know, perfect conditions to start making money. And um, but it's not just making money. It's like. For me, it's like actually the easy money to make is like where you're just riding the crypto bull market. Right. But. But the way I kind of approach it is like, yeah, I want to try and stay long as much as I can. But when the shit starts to hit the fan, like it has done recently, you can blindly sit there and watch your, the value of your stack get crushed by 50%. Or you can be like, okay, fine. There's some real technical damage here. I don't know where the bottom is in this thing. So I'm just going to make sure I'm using some hedges. I'm being sensible. I'm sacrificing some upside by selling calls to fund protection so I can stay in the game, basically. Yeah. Right? And then when the market looks more healthy and, and the bull trend resumes, I can lighten up some of those short calls that I've got on and, and you know, not need to replenish all my puts on the way up as aggressively, yeah. right? But for me, personally, I'm I'm hedging out nearly 100% of my stack right now, Yeah. right? Now, via, you know, puts, put spreads, whatever it may be, I'm not short too many calls on the upside, but... I think it would be silly not to have some hedges in place because this is it's a similar story to like in 2022. We were in that bull phase. We were up there near 60K or whatever. And then when we broke below 50, the people who didn't know how to use hedges, didn't know how to use options, just sat there, did nothing and watched it go from 50 to 30 to yeah. 15K. The people who understood options were like, okay, fine. There's been a lot of damage done here. Now I'm going to structurally make sure I always have some hedges in the book. Right. Yeah. So that if it just keeps going lower, even though I don't expect it to, I have some protection. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the world we're in now. Right. So you putting on put spread collars, things like that, that take advantage of higher vol levels. Yeah. You know, you don't have to pay crazy premiums for them because they're, they're net short vol. You you know, you can do like um, markets trading in the mid 50s right now. You have it at the money put, maybe short the 45K put a thousand, um, you know, 10,000 points lower. So you've got a 10,000 point put spread. 
you sell a call to finance that out to September, something like that. At least that gives you some protection that if this thing keeps going and doesn't bottom out yeah. until 45K, yeah. you know you're not just going to sit and ride that entire yeah. loss, basically, right? Yeah. I mean, what, one, one counter to that, I would say, is like you, you, these big vol events tend to mark turning points um, for for like all assets. Um, and I, I think... In crypto, we've kind of we've been talking about this range like for ages. I was called like 60, 70 k range, and we broke down to what fifty three k a couple of weeks ago, and then mm -hmm. got back up into range. Um, so certainly, it's going to clear cleared out any sort of weak hands in it. I mm -hmm. still think the structural flows are coming in, and actually, I've been impressed by the the the, bo the boomer holders of the ETFs have actually been buying, um, and we've had positive flows on on the, on the ETF side for Bitcoin. Um, so. I, I actually think, and and I'm I'm you know cognizant of the fact that FTX when FTX blew up, that marked the ding dong low for for Bitcoin before we started the next you know the you know the next bull market for mm. Bitcoin. So I I think it's going to be you know be be careful over the next couple of weeks. But I I think um I think we probably I don't think positions there to have a, a much deeper flush. But who knows. Um, mm -hmm. All the talk about jump selling and, and all this stuff, and, and that's probably just weighing on ETH more than anything. Yeah, I mean, um, the vol market, give them a quick and dirty summary on the vol market this week in crypto. So we saw a massive spike in implied on the crash, as as you would expect, but it's re it's retraced pretty fast, right? So front end implied went to 100 vol, yeah. right? They're back to like 60, so they yeah. didn't hang about, right? Skew has obviously flipped aggressively into puts. I think it reached near 20 vol for one week put skew, something like that. Yeah. It's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, that's retraced down to about six or seven now. So all of these spikes have kind of given three quarters of the spike back, right? Mm. Um, so, you know, I kind of, I tend to think these things don't bottom on the extreme. Like you get the extreme spike, then you get a dead cat bounce, then you get a retest, but on a lower vol, that doesn't see the same spikes in skew, the same spikes yeah. in vol, and then that's kind of your real bottom, basically. So I think we are in the bottom forming process. I just don't know if we're quite if there, we're there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that was kind of what we saw. So put skew, but again, the put skew is only there out till September. So October, December, etc., are all still in call skew. So crypto, the you know, and we also we often say the skew is the signal, right? It's, it's the options market telling you like what it thinks about the different time horizons. So clearly out to September, it looks like the crypto market is still pretty nervous, pretty cautious, but thinking that Q4 is where you get your rally, yeah. right? Yeah. And it, the other thing as well, like all these things, they, you know, everyone gets carried away, like uh, getting attacked on Twitter this week for things like, <laughs> you know, people saying, this is 2008, this is 2020. I was on a rates desk in, in at Lehman's in 08 and, and watched that world blow up. I was at I was trading FX in uh, 2020 and and being like this isn't this isn't that this isn't even close to it. No. Um, so I think it's a correction to a bull market in equities, in in crypto as well. Um, yeah, this trade is still probably a bit of overhang. The the other thing as well, we always fear where are the dead bodies? Are, are there any dead bodies? Someone's a few people are kind of blown up on this, and mm. how bad is that? We don't know. On that point, I'm going to catch up with the Galaxy guys later right. on today. We're going to slice that into this uh, this episode because those guys are massive in terms of market share in the options space. So they might have some color on, you know, if if the pain has been felt, you know, you know, or whether there's more more to come. Yeah, no, and I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing what those guys have to say. Um, obviously, just what their take is on it, what what they're seeing uh, from their sort of client base as well around this, and then and then how are they playing it and how they're going to position for things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so. Oh, you heard from us too. That's enough of us. And um, yeah, let's see. Let's find out what the Galaxy guys had to say. All right, everyone. I'm back. As I said, talking to the boys from Galaxy Digital. How are you doing, guys? I've got uh, John Kim here, based out in Asia. And I've got Bimnet Abibi. You're in the US. Welcome onto the podcast, guys. Thanks for having me. And nice. thanks for having us, Imran. Excellent. Excellent. So, Galaxy, you are the big boys. You are like the investment bank in crypto. So all in the flow, seeing what people are doing, seeing all the panic selling we've been seeing over the last few days. So give us give us some... Actually, before we do that, why don't you tell us how you guys got into crypto, what your backgrounds were before, and sort of a little... So people get to know you a bit better. 
Awesome. You want to kick it off, John? Sure. Uh, so I first delved into crypto when I was in college, uh, doing a little bit of uh, pre-ICO investments, um, but, you know, came across the crypto winner. And then eventually I started my career uh, in finance and JP Morgan doing equity derivative sales, eventually moved on to uh, trading risk, uh, mostly derivatives at a Hong Kong option market making firm trading Hong Kong single stock options, index options, uh, Cosby index options, uh, you know, before making a jump into crypto. Uh, well, you mean you got tired, you got tired of trading Cosby vol at 10, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was, it was more because I've always had one foot on the door into crypto. So I was a equity vol trader uh, during the day and then a crypto vol trader by night. Right. Um, so I, I needed some sleep. So I decided to, you know, have this as my day job. Nice. I started a little about a little over two years ago. Uh, I moved to crypto, uh, tried to start a, an options slash structured product desk uh, for a local Hong Kong custodian slash prime brokerage firm, uh, but eventually landed in uh, Galaxy uh, early last year. Uh, and I've been um, managing our franchise trading desk uh, during the Asia and a little bit of the London time zone uh, before passing it over to the U.S. Nice. And you, Bimnet? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I started my career uh, at Citigroup. Uh, I worked in uh, FX strategy for, you know, about uh, a year and a half. It was kind of like a cross-asset strategy role. Uh, and then I transitioned to single stock equity derivatives trading for about another year and a half. Um, you know, then that was you know, focused on healthcare, financial, what year, and what energy. Year was that? What year was so that? I, I graduated college in 2016. And so I was on the equity derivatives desk 2018, 2019. Oh, but that I'm, was based in the US, right? US, New York. Ah. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm a I city. I was a city about a year before that. Ah, uh, got it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so after uh, I finished uh, equity derivatives, you know, my, my kind of, interests were in rates and f facts and more like gross side of things rather than kind of the idiosyncratic like single name uh type of stuff and so right. uh, i transitioned to uh rates trading uh you know and i did that for about two 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 years and and a half um uh, focused on on front end uh ran the overnight repo book as well as you know a pretty uh sizable you know kind of prop book as well um, and then I kind of, uh, made my way to, uh, galaxy. I was interested in crypto at the time. Um, the main a anecdote I'll give you that kind of like convinced me to, uh, go into crypto was, you know, during COVID, you know, we, we had all these, you know, facilities and, you know, we fed printing money, et cetera. And I literally remember, uh, buying fed fund contracts, uh, and so for contracts through, uh, par. So essentially contracts that implied negative rates, right, mm -hmm. in, in the U.S. And I was like, this is absolutely uh, batshit. Uh, and so I was like, you know, what's the alternative? And, you know, that's how, that's what kind of got me into crypto. I was like, oh, you know, I'm moving billions of dollars to make a BIP or two. And like on Aave, I can deposit my stables and earn like 10%. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of really what, what, what drove my interest. And so I've been working at Galaxy for the past three and a half years, uh, focused on, on, on principal trading, uh, and, you know, so I've recently transitioned to, to do some, some more, uh, franchise oriented, uh, rate stuff. Um, but yeah, so I've been at Galaxy three and a half years, uh, been looking in for, for about five. Um, yeah. Nice. All right. So, um, and, you know, me and John talked a little bit yesterday, uh, but I'd love to hear your color on this. So, you know, you guys are in the flow. Um, crypto vol is obviously a maturing market, but it's still pretty young. Um, how, how are the landscape shaping up in terms of you know, who the main players or the types of main players are that are moving crypto vol around, right? So is it a case of, are, are, the bank, are there a lot of, you know, you guys are obviously one of the bigger banks in there, but you know, crypto hedge funds, is it hedge funds moving vol around? Is it miners? Are they doing overwriting protection strategies? Is there much structured products going on? Like who are really the big players in crypto options these days that are moving markets? 
yeah, I'll let, I'll let John take that one. Yeah. Um, I think, um, it's safe to say that, um, there's a few categories and within our client base, and I would say that covers a lot of the a majority of the ecosystem. Uh, we've got global macro hedge funds. We've got crypto VCs. Uh, we've got crypto hedge funds, um, exchanges, market makers, foundations, protocols, uh, high net worth individuals. And most of them do a little bit of everything. Uh, I think the, the main flows that we see are uh, um, directional clients like macro funds or VCs uh, or crypto hedge funds, mostly using optionality uh, to take directional views with leverage. Uh, and that is offset by, um, you know, some selling flow from foundations, um, some crypto VCs looking to overwrite against, um, you know, their inventory. Uh, so you've got a little bit of both. So it's not the miners, it's not the miners who sell calls against their, their stacks. You say, is it more, is it more the whales, like the high net worth types that are sitting on a massive pot or who, who is it that was really doing the call overwriting? So the miners do have an impact and do trade options as well. But, you know, when it, when you compare it to the total size of the option trades that are going through, I wouldn't say that they're the main, um, you know, impacting, uh, you know, ball, ball impacting contributors, I would say. And, and what I've noticed a lot in crypto is like when the vol spikes, the spikes don't last very long, right? So they, they can be dramatic. You can get a 40 vol spike like we saw recently, but literally you wait half a day and like three quarters of it's gone. So that, are there like loads of clients just waiting in the wings to smash any vol spike because they know that the, the expected value of that trade is so high? I think the interesting thing is that because we don't have as many market participants in crypto vol compared to traditional markets, um, the directional vol buyers uh, come in pockets when there is strong narratives, but then on the other side, the selling flow are very, very regular. And that's why you would see vol pops uh, when these vol buyers come in, um, but then eventually it gets faded over time because um, the selling flow are very consistent. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, in general, do you think people have done well consistently selling vol in crypto vol? Like, is there, you know, is there, a... <laughs> that, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I, I think depends on what, what period folks were, were, were selling, but that there's definitely been uh, a handful of quote unquote blow ups, uh, not recently, but especially early uh, in, in this market, you know, definitely a lot of folks that, that got burned selling calls. Mm -hmm. And I would even go further uh, and say that, you know, there, there's a lot of that type of activity that kind of drove some of the rallies that you saw in 2023 uh, with huge kind of like gamma squeezes that that happened uh, in, in, in the market. Yeah. Ethereum, yeah. ETH, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is um, all. You know, yeah. and... And if you think about Bitcoin as, as an asset, like its performance typically comes from a handful of days, mm. right? And so, you know, or like a couple of periods a, a year, let's say it's like four or five different days or, or something along those lines. That if you're one of the people that that's short vol during those times, you yeah. know, you really, you really get killed. Yeah. Uh, and, and what you kind of have to realize is that this isn't like, you know, S and P options. I can't go lift a, a yard and notional in, in like five minutes. Sometimes it's a, a buy appointment market. And it's also a, a market that's very, uh, capital intensive. You don't get netting versus like other assets. Uh, and you know, you, the, the, given the, the vol profile, you really have to, you know, maintain a, a huge amount of capital to, to sustain positions. And so when you have, you know, two, three standard deviation moves, uh, it really kind of exacerbates, uh, you know, the, the, the problems. And so, you know, I would, I would say that this is still a very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a developed asset class, but it's not anywhere close to, to, to what TradFi is. Sure. But I mean, it's growing, right? So, I mean, it is, it is. When we have this conversation in five years, it might look quite different. I mean, on that point, you know, the, the places that are growing, right? We've obviously had the massive ETF launch on both Bitcoin and now Ethereum. Uh, options on those ETFs are not trading yet, I believe, but I imagine they will be soon enough. Do you see that as a big game changer in crypto vol space? Like the ETF, first the ETFs coming on board, the institutional flow that they might bring, 
and then the option flow that comes on top of that. Absolutely. It's going to be a massive game changer for, for crypto. Um, you know, if you just kind of look uh, at retail options volumes on like big tech names or indices, et cetera, like there's a ton of it and it drives a lot of the, the, the price action uh, in, in the underlyings. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you do get the, the launch of those crypto ETFs, you're just going to see a surge in, in retail call buying. Um, and that, that'll likely just, just drag price higher. But, you know, essentially think about a market that's been around for over 10 years and, and retail hasn't really had the ability that, to buy options in it, even though retail has gotten more sophisticated with their options usage, liquidity has improved. And, you know, understanding ha has improved. And so when you actually have it launch, you know, I think you're going to see a ton of, of, of demand from, from retail and that should push price higher. It's funny that you say that. So if that's the demand that's going to come in on retail, what about the institutional side, though? What if I'm a what if I'm a big old insto who's now got access to ETFs and I can just own an allocation of my fund in the ETF? Aren't I going to be a cool seller and be overwriting against that? No, absolutely. I, I think you'll 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 see a lot of you know overriding flow th as a function of you know all these huge whale types that have accumulated the, the the ETF. You know, you'll you'll definitely see that. And over the long run, I do think that um, the introduction of of options will probably lead to longer term vols. You know, coming down. Um, but that's also that's typically what what you see when when an asset class like matures or an asset, you know, matures. And so if you get to like, you know, if you get to the size of gold, right, you look at gold and what kind of vol did that thing trade on? I'm guessing like 16, 17, 18 vols, right? Versus like, you know, what what are long dated, um, you know, Bitcoin vols at, you know, in the 60s or, or high 50s. And so, yeah. you know, as as the space matures you and, and grows in size, like it should be harder for, for it to move higher. Um, and it should also be harder for it to, to move lower in a sense because it's, it's more mature and, you know, they're institutional dip buyers, et cetera. And so I do think that uh, over the long run, you should see, see vols come down and the introduction of, of DTF options will, will help kind of accelerate that. But at the onset, you know, I think you'll just see, you know, pretty large kind of like speculative, you know, bubble almost. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I can sympathize with that view. I think basically the message is make hay while the sun shines because you're going to get like a few more years of super high vol in crypto and then it might be like a 30 vol asset class at some point, right? So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then, John, um, on, the other, on the other growth side of things, structured products, you know, there's, there's quite a few people out there. One of your main competitors, QCP, are quite all over this structured product side of things. Uh, is, that a, is that a space in crypto that you think has a lot of mileage or is it a case of crypto just just vanilla crypto offers you so much return, why you want to mess about with uh, structured products? I would say um, Galaxy does provide markets on, you know, a handful of light exotics and basic structured products. Um, and it is an area that we are looking uh, as one of our growth opportunities in the next few years. Uh, but if we look at uh, what's happening in the market right now, is there demand for it? Is there a trading volume? Uh, we think that the the market's not as mature yet uh, for this to become uh, a very very scalable and large uh, market um, that's you know uh, high in volume as of yet. Um, and just just because I think it's because you know there's many other um, profit making opportunities in crypto rather than structured products. Uh, that people are paying less attention to it for now. Uh, right. um, but, right. you know, like, Usually, like BIMnet mentioned, over the years with, with the asset class maturing, uh, walls coming lower, there's going to be more people looking for yield. Uh, and yeah. the, the demand for structured products is going to grow. So when there's yield all over the place, maybe not you don't need structured products as much, but when the, when the yield gets squeezed out from all the different areas of the market, that might still be an area where people can get some yield. Like that's certainly what we see in equities, right? Where structured products, one of the few places you can get yield is by doing longer dated structured products. Okay, uh, I want to move a bit on to like what's actually going on in the market now, right? So obviously we've had a big move down, big liquidations across the whole global cross asset spectrum. Um, but from a crypto specific perspective, 
do we think by the dip yet? Do we think there's more um, to come in this kind of crash now that we've broken out of these ranges to the bottom? Um, the political pivot that we're seeing, obviously, first from Trump and now what it sounds like from Kamala, that's got to be a massive positive, right? And kind of helps maybe fuel a Q4 rally if, you know, in the lead up to the election, all these guys are trying to get the crypto vote. But what do we think about this uh, this recent puke? Is it um, is it something you think still has legs? Um, it depends on on what part of the the crypto complex you're looking at. You know, I think in terms of the alt complex, particularly the tokens with high uh, you know token issuance coming up in the next year, um, I think those will continue to to kind of remain under pressure. Uh, just as simply as a function of, you know, demand su supply. Um, however, in, in, in Bitcoin, you know, I do think that going into the election, uh, you, you're, you're probably going to rally close to the highs would be kind of my guess, because you have to kind of start pricing in uh, like a decent probability uh, that the, you know, Trump wins and you get a, a crazy, not a crazy, but a, a very pro crypto candidate that that's going to be president of, of the United States. And so if you, you start pricing in like a reasonable probability of that happening and the only focus of the market at that time is going to be what are the election trades, right? It's like it's, it's a binary outcome. And so, you know, as you get closer to that election date, I think folks will realize that in a Trump presidency, you're probably talking about you know, BTC at 100K and higher. And so if that's a 50% chance and and you have Kamala that's inching more towards that direction, I think, you know, that expected value calculation for people should start to to go higher. And the attention that people give to that expected value calculation should, should also continue to go higher. So I do see us kind of rallying uh, going into the election, but I will caveat that with macro being kind of you know the ultimate you know barometer of, of, of where, where where things can go because you know i think if you see nasdaq puke another you know five ten percent and give up a lot of its its gains on the year because you know we're, we're more focused on a hard landing scenario i don't think crypto is going to do well in that environment um and the analogy i'll give is is kind of like you know what how does gold trade uh, in times of you know duress or financial crisis etc and it trades one correlation or highly correlated to, to, to risk, even though it's meant to be, you know, a debasement hedge. You know, just one example would be, you know, gold was falling during 2008, you know, GFC. Uh, and ultimately, you know, you'd be thinking like, oh, the, the Fed's printing money, lowering interest rates. You know, that should be good for gold. But at the end of the day, you know, when, when vol picks up, Folks are, are forced to de-risk when people need to liquidity that they sell assets that, that are liquid. Uh, and so I do think that, you know, you have to pay close attention to, to macro. Um, I think, you know, you've had, you know, some, some recent scares in the market that, that have kind of flushed out uh, a lot of, you know, speculative froth. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more froth that, that can be kind of taken out. Mm -hmm. um, and I do that's think- short -term, in, That's a short-term phenomenon though, right? I guess- yeah, no, absolutely. But at the same time, I'm looking at, you know, U.S. equities thinking that there's room for earnings expectations to, to move lower. There's also room for uh, multiples to, to move lower. And so there, there's kind of two levers that can actually uh, t take stocks lower. Um, so I'm very cognizant of, of, of kind of the, the equity risk. And also, you know, I think global growth, you're seeing a lot of headwinds uh, right now, you know, particularly uh, in, in China. Um, and, and some parts of Europe. And so I do think that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to start to see growth expectations can continue to move lower. Um, and so risk assets, I think, are going to be uh, a bit challenged, uh, you know, for, for the short term. I think it's, uh, I mean, my take on that would be that the, the lower growth expectations, the, the kind of cracks we're seeing in the labor market are essentially an excuse for central banks to start loosening, right? And so if, they are if they are able to loosen in that inflation is no longer a concern, then that's good for liquidity. That's good for things like Bitcoin, basically, right? Is that if they are somewhat handcuffed and they can't really cut as aggressively as they want to in fear of you know bringing inflation back, then that is probably worse for risk. So the real, that that's going to be what it kind of boils down to. So maybe the CPI print next week is actually quite important, right? So um, 
to see if we're still in that disinflationary trend and that gives the green light for the Fed to cut 50 if they want to in September, right? Um, but it sounds like the trade then, if we have to come up with a trade, like we might as well come up with a trade, right, on the show. So uh, yeah, my trade from what I'm hearing from you is sell September calls to own November, December calls in Bitcoin, basically, right? So like a some sort of call cool calendar where we're probably not going to break, we're not going to smash through the highs by September, but into the run up into the election, we're very likely to. So that might be a way of positioning for that. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a fair take. I, I am more inclined to just kind of uh, put on structures that get me into Bitcoin at, at levels that I like, uh, but also give me kind of, you know, upside exposure in case it rips higher. So, you know, I've been working into some some call spread collars, uh, selling uh, some downside puts to, to finance uh, call spreads. Um, I, I've been doing, you know, October month end maturity because that's, you know, a week or two before before the, the election. Uh, I also like, you know, doing that in, in kind of December as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, selling September to, to finance some, some of that stuff, uh, I'm a little bit more hesitant just because we've, we've come a long way, you know, Bitcoin high to low fell about 30% down to, to, you know, pretty critical support. And so, uh, you know, I, I just think you have, you know, kind of base effects at, at play here, um, just because of, of how far you've, you've come. So I'm a little hesitant to, to sell some of the the shorter dated stuff, but ultimately, you know, I, I think buying Bitcoin um, or, or, or selling like 50K puts, you know, some, something like that uh, to, to finance 70, 65, 75 call spreads, you know, things like that make sense here. And do you think ETH is just sort of dead money right now and you're better off focusing on the Bitcoin narrative because that's got the political backing as well? Like, what are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, no, I, I think ETH has a, a lot of challenges ahead, but I just, you know, think about it from a relative value standpoint. Uh, and, you know, I think most of the, the, the crypto native folks that, that we talk to here um, just favor things like Solana, um, just because it, it's a lot, you know, lower of a market cap. You know, th there's actual, you know, he heavy usage. You know, they see the scaling fire dancer coming up. Uh, and so, you know, I'd say most of our, our client base is, you know, thinking about ETH as, as an asset that's going to underperform uh, Solana um, in, in kind of any environment. Uh, and so to that extent, uh, you know, I'm not as, as constructive uh, on ETH, um, but I do think that kind of have at the, the deep grossing uh, event for it because, you know, you've had the, the ETH -E unlock and a lot of supply c come into the market for, from that. You've had this, you know, correction from, you know, BAJ, et cetera. Uh, and so it, it, it does feel like you're, you're probably close to a bottom, right? We almost tested 2000, nice big round number. Uh, so I am constructive from an outright standpoint, yeah. but from a relative value standpoint, yeah. I, I do think that you know, uh, Solana or making venture investments or even just being in, in Bitcoin because it's got a, uh, a more uh, safe profile, you know, to, to, to the downside. Like, I just think it, it's not that attractive. With that in mind, I do think you will see like periods of, of, of meaningful ETH out performance uh, because, you know, of some of the positioning that gets built up, right? Uh, a lot of folks will use ETH as, as a funding currency to fund Bitcoin or Solana or, or other alts. And so periodically, when you have that positioning, you know, get, get a little bit stretched, you know, you're going to have some, some corrections. Uh, and it's, it's still, you know, not the most liquid thing. And so, you know, if, if you have ETH start to outperform on a random Saturday night, and there's a lot of folks levered to to ETH from the relative value perspective, you might have like some, some pretty exacerbated squeezes. And, um, and but you I track that you track that positioning via funding rates. You can you uh, funding rates, open interest, the outright levels on things like ETH BTC, Sol ETH, yeah. uh, and kind of you know some of the flows that that we see on on the desk desk etc. Um, you know that's kind of how we would track it. But you know you you can also look at some of the the on chain metrics. I think today you. You had another two hundred fifty million dollars worth of USDC printed on on Solana. Like looking at you know the daily active users, some some of the newer uh, initiatives that that are, are being launched, social media. You know, so th there's a lot of ways to to kind of di dissect that that relative value and that positioning uh, dynamic. Uh, but high level, uh, in terms of what we've been seeing on the desk, is it's it's 
pretty much, you know, ETH weaker on a relative basis trades. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And the last thing, this little pop that we've seen in Bitcoin over overnight, um, you guys are we were laughing. You guys are telling me that someone bought like uh, five thousand perps in in about a minute, which is which created this pop of three thousand points on Bitcoin. Is that right? Yeah, it was pretty interesting when you looked at um, risk assets across the board. Uh, we had, you know, uh, most of the traditional equity markets uh, trading lower. Um, crypto was also grinding lower for most of the day. And then out of the blue at 9.44, uh, we saw a massive candle higher in Bitcoin from 55K all the way to a, a 58K uh, within a matter of minutes. Uh, and then obviously the rest of the market followed suit as well. Uh, and that's a quarter of a billion, it's a quarter of a billion yeah. more of Delta so, there in a minute, yeah? Yes. So taking a closer look at it, uh, we saw open interest uh, across the perps uh, drop by 5,000 Bitcoin units most of it coming uh, from Binance. Uh, so very likely that there was, you know, one guy or a couple of them basically short covering a massive amount of size in a, a very, very short period of time. Uh, and Bimnet, you, that, that squeeze. if I was your client, Bimnet, and I wanted you to buy a quarter of a billion dollars of Delta for me, and you had discretion to do it so that it didn't move the market, how long would you work that over? I would probably work it over 10 days, you know, 25 no, million, million dollars a day, not one minute. Uh, definitely not. Uh, you know, and I would use, you know, kind of the, the high volume periods to, to minimize the slippage, you know, like the ETF, you know, purchase window or, you know, U.S. equity open. Uh, yeah, no, and not during, um, you know, definitely not. five Asia when Asia. Yes, and that feels like someone wanting to move the market, right? That feels like someone actually ah, wanting ah. to move the market, right? Because you know you're going to have impact if you're going to do that in a minute. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Theories there, like it, it could have, honestly, it could have been an honest mistake, like a fat finger yeah. uh, where that guy added an extra zero or, you know, we we saw a pretty big resistance uh, at 57K for the past few days when ETH, when equities were rallying, when the rest of the market was rallying, uh, we saw a little bit of selling pressure in Bitcoin. And on yesterday's down move to, to 55K, this guy, uh, you know, might have just decided to cover all of his shorts. Well, for now, the level's holding, right? I mean, we're, we're still above 58K from what I can see. So uh, no, almost I'll... at 59. Exactly. It's not yeah. bad purchase for a minute's work. So uh, anyway, <laughs> guys, it has been... <laughs> A pleasure having you on the show. Very informative, really great discussion. And I will look forward to speaking to you again sometime. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks for having us. Okay. And that's a wrap for this week's episode, everyone. If you want me to keep bringing on quality guests like this, make sure you like and subscribe. And we'll see you next week. Yeah.